Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland PBS with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. Tonight, we're going to talk about a, 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 an issue that's pretty touchy for people to talk about. Uh, it's a program we have never done before on Currents, and I think it's one that is so much needed, and that is suicide and suicide prevention. And I hope that by the end of this show, we have done some things during this program that can help you if you are a recovering family or if you have people who are in need of help. Um, my guest this evening is Cassandra Lincolnmeyer, and she is the area uh, regional as an area director for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Thank you for coming on board. Um, it's a very, very timely topic. As, as we were talking before we went on air, one of the fastest growing areas uh, in the world, but also in Minnesota and the United States, is uh, depression. It's yeah. a very, very fast growing issue. And we need to have people like you and your organization that can help us start to deal with this. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your background mm -hmm. and a little bit about what the, what your foundation does. Yeah, so I came to AFSP a little over a year ago. Um, so I started in 2017. Um, prior to that, they were a volunteer-led organization. So there's two boards that operate here in Minnesota. So one is Greater Minnesota, which we you know, is basically uh, everything above Interstate 90. Um, all the way north and then our southeast Minnesota chapter covers the lower quarter of the state um, and so I came in to help these boards and to expand our work uh, across the state um, which is exciting we get to do more things in areas like Brainerd and the Lakes region and, and even further north um, so that's a little bit about what I do right I'm going to take the work that I'm going to explain here shortly um, and help to get to expand it so that's my role in Minnesota uh, I get to work with amazing people and volunteers all across our state um, but our organization started in the late 1980s. Um, it came, we came together as a group of researchers and a group of family members who had lost someone to suicide and wanted to know why, why this is happening, what we can do to help stop um, suicide and to create ways and programs for suicide prevention. So these two groups came together and founded the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, and we've been a growing organization ever since. We now have chapters in all 50 states. Um, there's people like me in most states or in chapters. So we're kind of regional or area directors all across the, the country. Um, and we kind of focus on four main areas as an organization. We look at um, you know, awareness and fundraising, that's with every nonprofit you're going to have. You're getting your name out, your event, and, and events to help raise money for your organization. But then we also um, are married your areas that are education, training, advocacy, uh, and loss support too. Um, so I kind of look at it into three main categories when we're, we're looking at our work, right? We have our uh, prevention training, which is everything we do on the front side. That's our, our, our trainings in prevention, our advocacy work. Um, we have our intervention training, which is kind of the middle of the road, and that's um, for in the moment, real, real at risk and crisis moments. And then our post-prevention work is our loss support and our suicide uh, out, survivor outreach program. Um, so we have kind of different areas that we work with people on all different levels, from prevention to intervention to postvention. Um, yeah, is there any, like, is there a particular area that you want me to, to expand start more with? on? What do you want me to start with? <laughs> well, uh, just to give you some of my own personal experience, I've had yeah. a number of friends who have lost family members through suicide in the past three months. And in the last couple of years, uh, probably I've known four or five families that have lost people. <clears throat> and the thing that I've always found is that, first of all, they don't want to talk about what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, and the second thing it seems like I always hear is there were no clues that this was going to be coming. Is that a common couple themes that you deal with? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, 
I'll kind of break that into two parts. So we have this first part where we're still dealing with a lot of stigma around suicide. Um, and it's something that can be very hard for people um, to bring up and to talk about. I lost someone very close to me about 12 years ago. Um, and as a Catholic family, we didn't know, like, we didn't know if we could talk about it. We didn't know if we could have a service in our, our church. Um, thankfully, things have changed, right? We, uh, even since that moment, and since I started this, this job and working with AFSP, I've, I've been able to see that change, which is good for us <clears throat> um, as a society, right? We're, we're talking a little bit more about it. It's still very hard. People are, um, tend to be afraid if they say the word suicide, they might cause that person to think about suicide. Uh, and, and what we are trying to, to put out there is that someone who is thinking about suicide has already thought about it. If you ask them directly, you know, say that word to them. It's not gonna be the first time that they've thought about it. Um, if you say, are you thinking about suicide? Have you thought about suicide? It's not gonna be a novel idea to them if it's you know the very first time that they heard that word. So not being afraid to use that word. Um, that's gonna help us reduce the stigma. We're also changed the language on, on how, we, how we say that word and how we approach it. For the longest time, um, the phrase committed suicide or committing suicide was something that people said, and they still do. It's very common to hear that. You, can, you hear it on television shows, you hear it in everyday language and conversations. Um, but what we are trying to get people to change the language part of it so that we say um, that someone died by suicide or took his or her own life. And the reason behind that is when we think of using the word committed, we think of committed murder um, or committed something else that someone might consider a crime or uh, in religious communities a sin, right? So um, the research uh, around suicide, um, which I'll jump into a little bit later on too, it's, you know, it's, it's not a crime and it's not, um, something that we we want to associate with that right you're not going to be put into to jail or prison um, so changing even just that little bit of it that phrasing on how we even approach suicide um, will help to decrease that stigma as well i was reading in the brochures that came from your organization and in minnesota we have a suicide every 12 hours mm -hmm. that is hard to believe isn't it i mean mm -hmm. it really is and it seems like more and more are young people, young high school kids, junior high school kids, and there's even have been elementary kids have talked about this. When you work in the area of prevention, how do, how do you approach that? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So <clears throat> in Minnesota, um, it's, it's about two people per day. We lose almost 800 Minnesotans every year. Um, and it, is that makes it the eighth leading cause of death overall in our state. But for young people, age 15 to 34, it's the second leading cause of death. Uh, in, in, so that's a big problem, right? And it's something that we, as a state uh, and community, should take and look at pretty seriously. The second leading cause of death for young people. Uh, it's pretty scary when you think about it. Um, and there's a number of programs and research that's being done in that particular area, programs that we're developing to help um, prevent that prevent suicide um, among young people. We have specific programs that we bring into schools. We partner with a lot of other organizations too to bring programming into schools um, or into religious communities, just anywhere where we can get people talking and get some education out there um, around it. But it's particularly tricky and heartbreaking to see young people um, die by suicide. It affects communities. I mean, any suicide is going to affect a community. Um, it's particularly heartbreaking, though, to see a young person. So the more we can get out there and get people talking about it on the prevention side of things, on being proactive in preventing it, um, the better off and the more lives that we can save, the better off our communities will be. I know I had one friend whose husband died by suicide. I'm trying to use your language. <clears throat> and he had this all planned out. He was teaching her how to lawn, mow the lawn with a riding lawnmower, doing all kinds of things. He was planning his exit. Is that typical or do you see a lot of it just random? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So that's, um, I'll talk a little bit about the perception that we see when it comes to someone who has died by suicide. So often we look at a triggering event, right? What we call an environmental factor. We'll see job loss or bullying or a divorce or a financial crisis, right? So we look at sort of this big life event in that person. Um, 
And, but what we don't see are these underlying factors. They might have um, you know, what we call historical factors. There might have been other people in their lives who have died by suicide who are related to them. And there's research being done into the genetic tendencies. Um, and there's also the, uh, so we have the environmental factors, which we see, the historical ones, and then um, biological factors as, as far as they might be living with a diagnosed or undiagnosed mental health condition. And we know that nine out of 10 people who do die by suicide are living with a mental health condition. Really? Again, whether or not it's been diagnosed or adequately treated um, is a big factor as well. Nine um, out of 10. Yep, nine out of 10. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's and we've actually studied, yeah, we've studied people's <clears throat> brains. So after they've died by suicide, if you look at a person's brain, um, it's chemically different um, than a healthy brain. And so we know that there are um, biological and possibly genetic factors in that person's brain and that person's structure that is influencing that, that decision and that choice. And so sometimes when um, the, the, you know, feelings of uh, uh, hopelessness and despair can come on really intensely and it can be um, you know, a very quick decision uh, or in, in that example that you provided, it can be something that's been building for a while and all these factors are playing a part um, and causing pain in that person. Um, and when that pain gets to a certain level, that person is just focused on getting out of that pain. It, they, their vision, um, not their vision, but their, um, it's like a tunnel vision almost, right? They're, they're only thinking about a way to get out of that pain. Um, and like I said, so sometimes it can be um, very intense and will come on and last for just a few seconds or a couple minutes. Or sometimes these feelings will last for hours. Um, so there's still kind of a lot of research into that, that question of why and how it can take someone, a, a, you know, a, what we look at is maybe a snap decision or it's something that they're planning for, which is a warning sign. Um, and we can talk about that too, some warning signs to look for but do you have any research to show how many people who uh, die by suicide might have just um, terminal illnesses yeah um, I don't know any of those facts and figures like off the top of my head but I know that there's research research done into that as well and that I think falls into um, your biological factor so um, I do know that certain illnesses can increase risk of suicide um, beyond mental health conditions so having you know, health problems such as diabetes or other things can influence that as well. So um, not just mental health conditions, but also chronic health conditions that physically affect the body can play a role in it as well. Recently, one of the national networks did a, a really good piece on a, a young girl who died by suicide. And there were a lot of family videos of her, of how happy she was. She was a dancer and an actor. And everything they saw was just this happy person but she had a diary, and this diary was so dark and so depressing. Mm -hmm. And when she finally died by suicide, they were totally shocked until they found that diary, and they found that it was almost like two different people in the same house. Mm -hmm. Do you see that from time to time with others too? Yeah, and I think <clears throat> um, when we look at, you know, I think, after a suicide, it's 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 it can be very tough and very hard for people to look back and try to identify. And it's but it's also very common. We we look back and try to see where what we have missed, right, or what we didn't see. Um, and I think for that particular individual, um, well, in in many cases, I think the the, the important part is. Um, the prevention side of it is letting people know that it's okay to seek help in those situations, um, and it's it's hard, you know, after a loss to to look back and think, well, where could we have done this? Right. Um, but I think we as a society, right, culturally, our communities can be better about this and promoting um, taking care of yourself as far as your mental health goes and your physical health goes, because that plays an important part as well. Um, but in those cases. I, th I think we need to, to really focus on that prevention sort of things and let people know that it's okay to not be okay. And if you are thinking about suicide, that's your indication, your clue to ask someone for help. You know, if you're feeling desperate and isolated, those are your indications to seek help. And there's a number of ways to do that. Um, it can be um, reaching out to someone you know that you're close to, but it can be as simple as sending a text message to our crisis line or making a phone call to the crisis line. And we, uh, as a country, are making that a lot easier. In fact, we just um, 
pass legislation and there's more money and funding federally that's going to continue to support both the crisis text line and our our national suicide prevention hotline um, so we can see on that high scale we are making this more of a priority there's obviously a lot more work that we can do um, but this is a really good first step and i think with that additional funding is going to be some more awareness uh, and so people will feel hopefully they'll have that resource, they'll feel more comfortable making that phone call. And maybe not on behalf of themselves, but you, if you see someone in your life that you're worried about, that's your indication, your clue to make that call, do some research online, find out a way you know, to offer them some help um, or for yourself to look to look for help as well. Um, but it's very hard to look back uh, at a, you know, after a loss and try to so many figure out what we could have done. Guilt. Mm -hmm. We've done something wrong. We didn't do this with our son or our daughter or our brother. Whoa. And then it's just something they don't want to talk about. There's that stigma about suicide that it's, it's this deep, dark place. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's like somebody committed murder. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard for people to talk about that. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's very mm -hmm. hard. And then when you work with people on their loss, mm -hmm. what are some of the techniques you use? What, how do you help people through that period? We are, well, our organization has really great resources for loss. Um, I'll give you a couple examples of what we do. So at, we, we have support groups for um, both adults and then teens and uh, yep, youth, and, youth and adult support groups. So we have those located across the state. Um, people can look online and find them. That's usually a good place for people to start when they're seeking resources for loss. Um, it's not always, and the important thing is to find what works best for you uh, to help you through your grieving process. Um, so we have support groups. We also at AFSP have our survivor outreach program where um, someone who's newly bereaved can reach out to us and we will match them with a volunteer for a one-time meeting, but a volunteer who's gone through a similar loss. And maybe it's a phone call, maybe it's their meeting for coffee. Um, in, in this day and age and with distance, maybe it's Skype, maybe it's an online video you know, chat or something, but we partner someone who has a similar loss um, simply to have that interaction with someone who can relate to you on a very personal level, um, who's experienced that sort of loss. Um, but grief is different for, for, for individuals. And so when we, we want people to find what they're comfortable with, sometimes it takes people years to reach out um, and to, to maybe attend their first support group meeting, maybe to attend their first event with AFSP or with a different organization about, um, you know, with loss and, and dealing with suicide. Um, and sometimes it's right away, you know, it depends on kind of where they're at and how they want to grieve. But um, it's, yeah, it's very personal, uh, but there are, I, I wanna stress there's lots of great resources and it's important to find something that works for you. As a person who has lost someone, um, you then are at a higher risk yourself for suicide. So it's really important as a grieving person to take care of yourself too during mm -hmm. that process. Mm -hmm. So finding the help, reaching out to your family doctor or practitioner, um, reaching out to the support groups or survivor outreach program, um, those are, they're gonna help you heal and stay safe as well. You, you talked about uh, the brain scans that are being done by people and that's really fascinating to me because they're doing that with football players or people who have CTE. Mm -hmm. um, it's, are, is there much information you have yet to see if there's a genetic link in families? Yeah, that's another part that, so um, traumatic brain injuries are, um, have been linked to an increased risk of suicide. So, um, you know, those athletes who are injured that way, people who are injured in car accident or other traumatic ways, there is, there's uh, a risk, an increased risk for suicide. And it's again, your brain is changed a little bit chemically. You might also be suffering from, again, a mental health um, condition too. You might have depression or anxiety as a result of this. And that can again be a factor for suicide. I've had a friend in the health field who told me that his experience is when someone decides they're gonna commit suicide, you can't stop them. You can delay it but later on they're going to do it. it is that a fair statement? Um, it's, it's not accurate. If, if someone um, who has tried, um, and they, we call them a lo uh, lived experience, someone who has, is lived experience, um, they, most people who um, are thinking about suicide or have attempted do not go on to die by suicide. Um, and so, and 
It's good that you bring that up because one of the ways that we keep people safe um, in that moment is removing them from that potential situation if someone is actively um, you know considering or at a high-risk situation um, removing them from that and creating space between uh, them and their um, what we call their their lethal means or their preferred means um, and so creating that space or removing that means is going to help keep that person safe um, and that can be uh, we we see that in, in different ways but if you want I can give you a couple examples of mm -hmm. that as well. So um, we know that firearms are used in 52%, a little, a little over 50% of deaths, suicide deaths. And so removing that or, or creating good education and, and uh, if you're a gun owner, um, knowing how to keep your friend or someone safe or how to keep your gun safe if there's a crisis is important. Um, again, creating some space or just having a gun lock right on your weapons too can keep someone safe. If it takes maybe three seconds to take off a gun lock, it might be three seconds that stops that person. So uh, again, a little bit of space right there. Blister packaging and potentially lethal medications can help keep someone safe if they have to punch out um, the individual pills. Again, that's creating some time between that decision and their, that, that means, right, that action. Um, Community-wise, installing barriers on bridges can help deter steer, uh, suicides, and that actually um, can deter that individual, um, but also can help bring down the whole rate for that region mm. on those particular bridge barriers. And a, another common one um, are installing CO, uh, carbon monoxide, is that carbon right? Carbon dioxide. Yes, carbon mm. dioxide. Uh, sensors in your car so if it reaches an unsafe level your car will shut off oh. so there are ways um, to give people time right to give them time between that that reaction um, that choice and that that means and that that time is what can save their life mm -hmm. so you talk about the biological side of things if they're able to someday start seeing that there are brain issues where people are tendencies to do this do you see that maybe medications coming that will will help people deal with that? Yeah, yep. Um, and that's, I think that's good, again, part of like being, um, you know, treating your mental health condition in, in what way works best for you. For some people, it's, um, you know, combinations of psychotherapy or medications. Um, it can be either or. The important thing is to find what works best for you. But yeah, absolutely, medications can help um, just get people healthy. Sometimes it, it might mean a lifetime being on that medication mm -hmm. or it might be a few months. It's whatever you know the program is for you. But yeah, it, I think the, the important part is to find what works best for you, whether it's a combination of therapies or medications. Mm -hmm. And you've talked a little bit, obviously, the loss and the, the impact that it has on families, but this has a huge economic impact in mm -hmm. Minnesota and nationally. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, the latest report that we, um, that we ran showed that in the United States, um, it's, it's $69 billion lost in productivity and wages per year. So that's wow. the fiscal impact that it has um, on it. Uh, on us as a country um, and just we know that for every person who dies by suicide there's at least a hundred people who are affected by it on average right and so that could be entire communities are affected by it so again that fiscal part uh, plays a big part of it too but it, there's other social levels that are coming into it too for your entire community that's a mm -hmm. lot of money mm -hmm. and you talked a little bit about loss but uh, about the science of loss what what's happening there what are they studying there yeah so there's <laughs> all there's really great programs or excuse me research programs that um, we're funding we're the largest private funder of research for suicide and suicide prevention uh, and you can read about them online uh, but there's some really exciting stuff coming out as far as new methods for prevention um, again studying how our brains are working chemically and I'll be excited I'm excited to see down the road some of the results of these these projects that are happening right now. Uh, but it again, these we're actually seeing now these these research projects result in uh, things that we can use as far as new um, treatments and programming and education um, to help people stay safe and stay alive. How about the families that just have gone through this loss? Do you have programs? You said you have support groups, you have networks of people, but. A lot of people don't feel comfortable calling support groups. Uh, is there places online they could go, or do, is there other places that could help them if they're, if they're a private family and they just they need some help, but they're maybe not 
comfortable asking for it. Yeah, uh, I would say start with our website. Go, it, like it, that's a great place to start. You can see the resources listed there. Listed there as, as far as if you're thinking uh, about suicide, or if a family member um, is thinking about suicide, or if you know someone who has died. Um, so different ways to kind of channel how you, the, re, the the support that you need and the resources that you need. Um, but I also think too, as an individual, finding the people close to you. Um, for some, it might be re reaching out to um, maybe a member of their like religious community or um, just a close personal friend, someone that they can open up to. Um, but that's where I would start is, is finding the way that's, that's comfortable. Maybe it is just doing online and looking at AFSP's website or other websites for programming. Also counties offer, or offer services. Um, our state offers services and programs as well. Um, so there is support out there. It's a matter of finding it. And I know that you know, Minnesota is a big state. There's lots of rural areas, and I'm very thankful that we do have, you know, our, our the suicide prevention line, and we have, um, in most places, internet access where you can reach it because it might be a two-hour drive to your family doctor or your, you know, your mm -hmm. your practitioner. And so, having some of that stuff, um, either that you can call in or look online, is really important. I think in that grieving and healing process. And, and that's the Minnesota Air, or the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention dot org. Yep, it is just our uh, an acronym AFSP.org. AFSP.org. <clears throat> yep, and our website has not only the loss support but also our training programs on there too for more education if you want to work on the prevention side of things as well. So organizationally, we got about a minute left here, but organizationally, what's your biggest challenge? I personally, I think our biggest challenge is still the stigma associated. Um, with suicide uh, and the the challenge of getting people to seek help when they need it um, maybe not in a, in a crisis situation but just if they're feeling depressed anxious um, getting people smart about their mental health getting our culture smart about mental health is going to save lives so i think for me changing that perception around um, you know, it's, it's not easy to pull yourself up by your bootstraps if something is wrong in your brain, if you are hurting. Um, you know, mental health is just as important as physical health. And so for me, that's the big, that's the big perception shift that I want to see. Well, thank you for jumping on yeah. with this. It's really powerful information. And I hope that people will use your website. Yeah. Uh, it's great work that you're doing. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you for having me. You've been watching Lakeland Currents. We're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time.